Good morning and welcome to the Ag Now Roundup. My name is Dave Deacon. When folks think about a corn crop, they think of states that begin with I, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa even, and of course, I-80. But there's a whole nother region to the United States that also produces corn. It's the southern corn crop, say along I-40. This morning, we're taking a look at corn from North Carolina to Arkansas. And we'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. But first, here's a look at your weather with meteorologist Matt Makins. It's your Ragnow Weather Report. I'm meteorologist Matt Makins. In last week's report, we kind of went through a depth focus of, of the outlook for the next couple of weeks. I want to be more specific since this version is more about the corn, especially across the south. But what are the impacts this time of the year that we're watching out for? Obviously, a cold impact. Obviously, a moisture impact. Whether you still need a little bit more precip or you're hoping it holds off so you can get the harvest in, Depends on exactly where you are, right? So let's focus in on that. Overall, I'm worried about a frost or a freeze across the northern portions of the Corn Belt. That'll be the 9th and 10th of October. And then next week, from the 15th to the 18th, we'll have to worry about the possibility of some impactful cold across the central states. So temperatures beginning to increase their impact on the corn this season. What about the chance of actually hitting frost or a freeze? I've given you the probabilities here. Notice the west. I mean, the high probability Rocky Mountain areas, they're going to frost, they're going to freeze. Upper Midwest is a bullseye of very likely conditions to hit frost or a freeze over the next 10 days. Appalachians through New England. As far as most of the corn areas, say Des Moines, Omaha, southward into Oklahoma and northern Arkansas, we do have some pockets here where the probability does increase to hit at least 36 degrees. Now those probabilities, like right around in here, Osage country, they're relatively low, for the most part below 50%, but it's that time of the year where we're going to watch these probabilities of impactful cold temperatures increasing. And again, this is the probability of hitting 36 or colder during the next 10 days. So overall, I do think the biggest impact for central and northern corn areas is that frost and freeze on the way for Monday and Tuesday. And then we'll be watching out for this pocket of colder area, which, which will actually impact more of the corn producers uh, for next week. So at least a slight chance to have some impactful cold uh, for next week. What about the precip coming through? We have a lot of precip coming across the country for the next seven days. There's bullseyes in the Pacific Northwest. There's bullseyes here across the South. More on that in a moment. And then for uh, a lot of the corn areas, we have a good swath here of some water. So anybody that may still need that water, we're going to be looking at this, this deeper red area, and that, that covers a lot of Nebraska and south, southern South Dakota all the way out toward the Great Lakes. That's registering two and a half to three inches of total precip on the way over the next seven days. Maybe it's badly timed for you, or great, Again, depends on your case. What about the precip down here to the south? We're going to have more on that in a moment because that may be tropical system related and eyes on that. But in terms of impactful rainfall, how much is too much? Well, there may be too much in this pocket here from Kansas City to outside Omaha up toward Chicago, New England states down to the southeast. But this bullseye right in here, that goes from the 11th to October 12th to watch out for the potential of just too much water too suddenly. So there could be some isolating flo uh, isolated flooding there. Now, we mentioned the cold already, frost and freezing conditions. What about the risk that some of that precip not be in the form of rain? What if it's in the form of snow or ice, if the case may be? Those probabilities are very, very low. A probability of getting at least some snowfall, seeing some snowflakes, getting at least a trace of snow, is highest to the Rocky Mountain West. There is some increase in the probabilities in parts of Nebraska and uh, South Dakota. Yes, in Iowa and southern Minnesota into Wisconsin. Yeah, we have some pockets here where the probabilities are at least on the map, but they're very low in probabilities to see some snow or frozen precip over the next week to 10 days. That's probably favorable for harvest or wrapping up the corn for this season. Now, I'm going to mention this a couple of times previously in this video, but we're watching. This is the tropical kind of outlook map that the Hurricane Center would use to say, hey, watch out for these areas. There's an area of disturbed weather down in Mexico, and it's going to cross into the Gulf. And the Gulf of Mexico is very, very warm. So we're going to supply a lot of energy into that 
disturbed weather area. Whether or not it turns into a tropical storm, a hurricane, anything like that, it's too early in the game to say that. Just be watchful for that and potential impacts on Texas, uh, Louisiana, Arkansas, with some moisture headed that way. And on that precip map I showed you a few moments ago, stretching across the south, that's why I said may come with a tropical element. So we'll keep an eye on that one for you and have further updates on that in social media. Until the next Ag Now Weather Report, Matt Makins here. Well, thank you so much, Matt. When we think of corn production across the United States, we primarily think of the states along I-80, but there's a whole nother corn belt across the southern part of the United States along, say, I-40. Let's start out with our discussion about southern corn on the Ag Now Roundup with Dr. Ron Heinegger from North Carolina State University. Uh, Dr. Heinegger, is there really a difference in corn production across the south? Across the south? Well, yes, there is a difference. Uh, it might be maybe a subtle one in, the, in most cases. I mean, mostly we use similar hybrids to the southern corn belt here in the south, southeastern United States. We don't have a lot of hybrid development being, being done out here. Uh, we do have some breeding, uh, public breeding programs at some of our universities that focus on disease, which I think is important here because we're the disease capital of the world in many ways in the southeast. We get frequent rainfall, it's warm, it's humid, perfect disease kind of weather. So from the corn, hybrid standpoint, we're very similar to the southern corn belt. The differences really come into play where we start talking about the climate and the soils here in the southeast, where our soils aren't the deep, uh, less soils of the Midwest. We have a coastal plain, their sandy loam, uh, their water holding capacity is somewhat limited. Our saving grace in that respect then is that we do get more frequent rainfall events in many ways. Uh, so that sort of offsets that a little bit, but not to entirely. Well, you mentioned uh, increased disease pressure. What are we seeing across the southern uh, part of the United States whenever it comes to corn production that we may not see in uh, across the northern part? Well, yeah, we get a lot of southern uh, leaf blight in the uh, coastal plain region. I don't know that we see a lot of that in the, in the I states, or the Corn Belt area. Uh, we get northern leaf blight in the Piedmont. Now, I think you guys, in fact, years and years ago, it was northern corn leaf blight that was a, a pandemic that struck corn back in the 70s or whenever that was. Uh, so you guys see some of that. The disease that probably affects us the most is southern rust. Southern rust is a uh, tropical disease similar to common rust in corn but it, it uh, cannot overwinter very well. So it starts out in the Caribbean or the Central America, those windblown spores come into the Southeast of the United States and they work up the coast there. Uh, our, uh, how we deal with that is we hope it doesn't come early enough so that we get the crop finished before Southern rust sets in because it's a, it's a more uh, difficult disease to control. It's very aggressive. Once you start seeing an outbreak of southern, you you should have uh, probably applied a fungicide a day or two earlier once you see it. Whenever it does come to that disease pressure, um, what are you suggesting to the growers across North Carolina? Well, of course, we, we try to emphasize the hybrid resistance where we can. The one disease I didn't mention was Grayley's spot, which uh, most of the actual uh, breeding or for uh, gray leaf spot resistance is done in, in the mountain valleys of western North Carolina where it stays humid and, and foggy most of the day. So they have perfect environment for that. But uh, so resistant hybrids is one tool uh, that we really look at very closely. And then of course fungicides. Uh, the fungicides that we have today are very uh, good at common rust, southern leaf light, even northern leaf light, fungicides are uh, very effective. We see a lot of uh, growers in north, in the southeast United States, certainly in North Carolina, applying a fungicide about BTR1 uh, to corn for these kind of disease outbreaks. But uh, 
I have to say that hybrid resistance has been solid for us. It's really helped us from the time I started this job 30 years ago till today. We've seen a, an improvement in these hybrids that are able to resist these diseases, and that's helped a lot for these growers in the southeast. So just whenever it comes to planted acres, are, are, are we seeing an increase in the number of acres across North Carolina? Well, yeah, compared to the I states, I often say that uh, we're a way distance uh, apart from them. Uh, we have roughly, yeah, over the last five years, we've grown anywhere from about 950,000 to a million acres of corn. You know, that's, uh, that's a drop in the bucket in Iowa as far as acres goes. Uh, we used to, you know, back in the turn of the I'm talking about the turn of the 20th century, not the 20th, not to this century, back in the 1900s, why we had over two and a half million acres of corn, but, but you have to remember there's been a lot of uh, uh, development in the Carolinas. Uh, uh, you know, but many of our corn acres were in the Piedmont. Those are now houses or, or reforested. Uh, the, Try to reduce erosion, so so we're down to about a million acres now. We ranked about 18th, 17th, 18th in the nation as far as the amount of corn we produce. So generally, we're around 120 million, 100 million, 120 million bushels. Uh, this year, our yields look really good. I think we may have close to a record corn crop in North Carolina. Might, might miss it by just a little bit, but our yields have been really, really good. Our average yield, in, by the way, in North Carolina is 145, 50 bushels to the acre. Not again, not a, uh, not like some of the Corn Belt states, but that's not a bad yield. I think we may top that this year uh, in yield. We're very similar to the uh, rest of the country. We in, we're increasing yield year over year. They do the better hybrids, management, those kind of things. So we try to stay relevant in, in terms of acres and yield here in this state. Tell us about some of the research that you're doing with North Carolina State University whenever it comes to uh, corn production across your state. Yes. we're. Probably some of the, there's two studies that I think have been really important to North Carolina corn growers and the future of corn here in the state. One of them is understanding the role of, of emergence and early growth in our corn crop. Um, we really want this crop out of the ground in seven days and very growing very aggressively up through V7. And there's a lot of reasons why that's important, that uniform, quick growth. One is roots. Because our soils lack the water hole, we have to explore that very thoroughly with our root system. So what we have found is that early germination growth reflects in a root system because really roots are what that plant tries to set down first is, is its, its nodal roots. So that's been very helpful. If you look at our, our corn yields over the last several years, and how well we've done at planting time, getting off to a good start, there's a direct correlation between those two events. So what we ended up here at North Carolina, we developed what we call a corn climate dashboard. And what it does is it shows the growers how many heat units they're gonna accumulate over the next several days. So they choose a planting date that matches about 40 or 50 heat units over those next four or five days. And then it also gives a fairly localized accurate re record of rainfall. We do not, <laughs> in the spring, oftentimes we could get a four or five inch rain in a heartbeat. We don't want that following the planting. So we try to uh, give them at least an idea of uh, what that rainfall outlook. So if they can get that right day as far as the temperature and miss that heavy rainfall events, they can get this corn off. So that research has been a uh, very valuable uh, uh, advance here as far as our corn growing uh, and in the future, I think it's going to be very important to these guys. The second thing we've done is look at temperature. As you might uh, guess, that's an important part. We really do not like to see temperatures over 95 degrees at our uh, in corn during pollination. So we've done some things to try to understand the role of plant populations, seeding rate, uh, row spacing, 
and even uh, some of these um, tools uh, like um, bacteria, uh, biological seed treatments on the role of temperature. Now, these all relate to how much root, where you get your roots and how far they can spread out in the competition between plants. And to some degree also relate to um, how wind, laminar wind flow in the canopy affects temperature. Well, it is really interesting um, kind of how crops migrate across the state. You know, in, in many states, it's just one swath of planting and then uh, the same thing for harvest. But it sounds like in North Carolina, it, it's kind of a march from the coastal regions all the way up to kind of the triad, the, 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 the Piedmont region. Right. It, and it takes a little bit of time. That's exactly right. Our, our temperature gradient goes from the coast to the mountains. And of course, your mountains are very cool. You're you're waiting and waiting for the, that uh, uh, plant period to start out there, versus uh, down in the southeast on the coast. So, so it's a very interesting, diverse environment uh, that that we have here in the state. The other, I, I, I mentioned while we're talking about plant dates, I, you, I mentioned this climate dashboard. You might ask, well, how often do we get optimum planting windows? You know, and I, I gave you them the total planting window, but how often, well, it turns out uh, there's only about two times between the last week in March and the middle of May that you have an optimum window. So so these guys have gone to bigger planters, they want to get it done in, in three, to five, three to five days when that optimum window hits. Well, thank you so much for going on with us on the AgNow Roundup and, and telling the rest of the country about uh, the corn production practices in the North Carolina area and in the Southeast region of the United States. You betcha. Thank you for having me. It's been so, so wonderful to talk to a fellow Midwesterner. <laughs>And now we're heading west down I-40 to the great state of Arkansas, where we're catching up with University of Arkansas's Dr. Jason Kelly. Dr. Kelly, tell us about uh, the corn crop across Arkansas. Yeah, Dave, we, we overall we had a, a, a really a pretty good corn crop. Th this year we ended up planting 850,000 acres according to the last uh, USDA numbers. And, you know, that's not a record, but it's almost a record. And so 890,000, I believe, was uh, the record. Uh, but before that, you'd have to go back to early 1950s before we had that kind of acreage. So I think we had the second highest acreage in the last 70 years or so. And so, you know, we, we had a lot more corn. And I, I think part of that is we had uh, the, the, a good planting window. So April, uh, March, April were relatively dry for us. And that's really what we got to have to get, get the corn acres planted timely. And so th this year we got everything planted really timely. Uh, yeah, you know, the season wise, uh, you know, the, we're, we're essentially done with harvest right now. There's still maybe a little bit of corn out there right now, but, but we're essentially done. And, you know, the estimates, yield estimates are coming in about 180 bushels per acre, which, which is pretty good, you know. Uh, you know, I think most people don't realize that uh, a majority of our corn can be irrigated. So pro probably maybe more so than uh, many of our surrounding states. So that, that for us, when we have a dry summer, which, which we did have a dry summer this year, that the ability to irrigate helps take out those up, ups and downs that we typically get. And so, you know, 180 bushel crop is uh, really about our 10 year average on yield. And so I, I think uh, initially I thought we would probably have a little bit higher yield than that and, and in the end those numbers still may go up a little bit but we had some wind storms there in June that caused a lot of green snap a lot of lodging in certain areas and I think statewide that, that probably pulled the, the uh, yield down a little bit for us. As you made it through the 23 corn crop across Arkansas did you see much uh, disease pressure insect pressure across the crop? You know uh Insect wise, we, we, we didn't. And so, you know, for, for us, corn borers is really probably the, the insect that we're most concerned about. And so, you know, of course, we got BT corn that, that takes care of a lot of the, the, the corn borers, but we do have a lot of conventional corn in some areas. So non GMO corn, especially in parts of central and uh, northeast Arkansas. So, you know, those areas we might have 10 or 15% of the acreage that is, is non-GMO. So the producers, 
historically have got a premium for, for that non-GMO corn, so that hence we're, we're growing that, but you be aware of But You know, overall insect pressure was relatively low. Uh, foliar diseases, I know that's always a concern for us in, in our environment, right? You know, I think uh, statewide, we probably average close to 50 inches of rainfall a year. And so, you know, war warm conditions, get, when we do get the rainfall, we, we do have some disease pressure usually. So this year, uh, relatively dry. So April, May, June, July, you know, we got some rainfall in July, but it, it, you know, southern rust is our, our main uh, work. You know, it always seems like if we get a wet April, May, June, especially points further south of us, you know, it blows in here. So that's where we get uh, a lot of stuff coming in. And this year, uh, it didn't show up till early July. So it really showed up kind of the tail end of the crop. And so, you know, a lot of our corn is sprayed with foliar fungicides just uh, as a preventative measure. But, uh, you know, actual disease-wise, there wasn't that much out there. So... You know, the diseases we typically have would be southern rust. That's our, our main main concern. We do have northern corn leaf blight some years, certain hybrids, uh, gray leaf spot, and uh, southern corn leaf blight. Those are the really the four main foliar diseases. And, of course, we have stock rots sometimes that, that cause issues, and we had some of that this year as well. Uh, the, fortunately, the, the disease we have not found yet is tar spot. You know, that's something that, uh, you know, you hear about in the news and all that. But fortunately, the, the tar spot is still a ways to the north or east of us. So that's something we haven't dealt with yet. How does uh, Arkansas corn, um, Oklahoma corn, Tennessee corn, Louisiana corn, how does that vary from, um, from the ice state corn, the, the, the northern corn crop? Well, I, th I think it's it's different. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, the, the southern corn crop, whether it's Oklahoma, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, you know, uh, we're, we're growing different hybrids. Um, you know, most of our corn, you know, at least in Arkansas, is probably 115, 118 day hybrids. So, you know, there may be some hybrids that get, are planted here. They're also planted in Illinois or Indiana, but some of them aren't. And so, you know, typically we're growing full season hybrids and that's where typically where our highest yields are. And so, you know, we've done some planting uh, or some studies looking at relative maturity on corn. And in our environment where, you know, where we're able to irrigate and, and get top yields, you know, anything less than say 110, 112 day hybrids, just, just not going to, the yield is just not going to be there. And so that's why our producers typically plant full, full season hybrids. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, there, there's some hybrids that uh, do, do well here and some that don't. And so, I know what, one of the reasons why our corn acreage has went up is that I think we, we've finally got some adapted hybrids that were selected in this area that do well here. And so, you know, historically our yields have, have went up in the last 20 years quite a little bit. And so I think part of that is due to the of course, management, of course, management styles, but also we've gotten some hybrids that perform well in our environment. One of the great things about your position is that that, that you talk to the producers across Arkansas and, and you're able to help um, work out new uh, research to help those producers across the state. What kind of uh, research are you conducting for uh, corn producers across Arkansas? You know, this coming year, uh, you know, like you say, looking to figure out where that next 20 bushel is going to come from. So this past year, we're doing a lot of plant population work. So, some nitrogen work, you know, ni nitrogen, you know, we would think that, you know, yields go up, nitrogen goes up. Well, if we're a little more efficient with it, maybe we don't need more nitrogen. Maybe we just need to put it out a little different timing. So, you know, a lot of our focus, you know, we're, we've got a lot of different projects going. So we've got agronomic projects, some of the things that, that I typically do, plant populations, uh, planting date studies, that sort of thing. We've got uh, fertility studies. Uh, weed control, economics, uh, insect, insects. So we've got research going on basically in all different facets of production that our farmers need to be looking at. You know, one thing that was really evident this year it was the, the timeliness of harvest and planting. So, you know, we talk about getting, getting 
crop in very timely, and we did that this year. A lot, lot, you know, we, over time, people have got larger equipment. We've got speed planters that we can plant that, you know, eight to 10 miles an hour instead of our normal three or four. So, you know, it doesn't take very long to get the corn crop in, which which is good. We can get it planted during the, the, the optimum time. And I think we're doing that. And, and this year, you know, I alluded to earlier that we get a lot of rainfall, typically 50 inches of, of rain typically. But, you know, this harvest, uh, you know, we had some fields know that uh, from maturity to harvest it didn't have any rainfall at all and so a lot of times we got everything harvested timely didn't have wind vents i know one one year or, or i guess there's always a concern to have a tropical storm come up through from the gulf and come up and, that, and that's where we have some issues some some years that you know big winds or lots of rainfall lodging problems and we just didn't have that this year we, we got a really harvest window well, Dr. Kelly, thank you so much for going on with us and talking with us about the corn crop across the great state of Arkansas. Yeah, well, I appreciate the opportunity, Dave, and uh, enjoyed the program. And of course, we want to thank you for watching this episode of the AgNow Roundup. And you can go to our website, agnowtv.com, and you can find out more information about what we talked about, see the full episodes there as well. And of course, sign up for our email and check out our social media accounts. That's a lot, all in one website. Check it out, agnowtv.com. And from our farm to your farm, I'm Dave Deacon for AgNow.